The following feature presentation is part of the Skywalking Network. Welcome to Star Wars Ologies, the podcast about science and other academic fields of study seen in Star Wars. I am one of your hosts, James Floyd. I am a freelance contributor for Star Wars Insider Magazine and StarWars.com. And I'm your other co-host, Melissa Miller. I also write for Star Wars Insider Magazine, and uh, I'm a freelance science writer. This episode, Star Wars Ologies, is going to chat about artificial intelligence and machine learning, as represented in Star Wars by droids, astromechs, bounty hunters, all sorts. Our guest expert today is Gracie Ermey, who is a machine learning scientist and an if-then ambassador for the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Welcome, Gracie. Thank you. Excited to be here. We're very happy to have you on the show. First and foremost, can you start off by defining what is machine learning? What is artificial intelligence? I admit I use the term sort of interchangeably. Um, And then maybe tell us a little bit also about how you got into this field of study. Yeah, I would say, you know, a lot of people probably use those terms interchangeably, and I I often do as well. Um, So artificial intelligence, though, I kind of think of as like how we get computers to do something automatically for us. So that's kind of a broad umbrella term. And then machine learning is kind of one subset or one sort of realm of methods within that term. Um, And often, I think, what like things we would think of as artificial intelligence in the world like um you know siri and automatic uh, self-driving cars sort of things um those are at this point at least um powered by machine learning techniques so it's a very popular ai method um and and how machine learning works is it's basically a lot of math behind the scenes and what we do to train a machine learning model is we show it a lot of examples of what we want it to learn. So if we want it to learn to recognize like difference between dogs and cats, that's like a a very common uh, example that's used. We show it a lot of pictures of dogs and cats. We have to show it, you know, dogs in every single position that we can think of and cats in every single position and all different types of cats and dogs. Um, And it starts to learn the patterns in that data that, that we're showing it. What sort of collections of pixels and patterns within the pixels make up the different features of dogs or cats. And then when we show it new pictures that it's never seen before, hopefully if we've done our job well and shown it data that's representative of like all the different cats and dogs out there, then it can learn to recognize the difference in pictures it's never seen before. That's That's kind of (laughs) of crazy when you think about it. That's something that we as humans can do pretty easily. Yeah. But to teach a computer how to do that and have it be able to basically extrapolate from what it knows to then match the data. That's that's huge when you think about it. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Human brains are really incredible. Like the things we can do just super easily um, when you try to break it down. It's a lot of these tasks are not easy. <laughs> so did you grow up with Star Wars at all? Did it influence, you know, your career track? Or do you think about it when you when you watch the movies? Yeah, so I definitely grew up with Star Wars, um, watching the movies with my family and stuff. And as like the new shows have been coming out, have definitely been keeping up. And that's like been almost easier maybe for me to like connect to in a lot of ways. I don't know if it's like the new characters that they're bringing in or just the storylines are like, I feel like more connected to the more recent stuff, but definitely have fond memories of like watching the movies with my family. Yeah, I, I growing up, I was not super into like tech or space or like a lot of, um, I guess the themes within Star Wars and the technology in Star Wars, but sort of found myself in this technology career path as I got older and discovered kind of like all the different cool options that are out there. But yeah, so thinking back now, it's like maybe Star Wars did influence that in some way, but not intentionally, I guess. (laughs) Well, let's dive in a little bit. You know, obviously Star Wars has so many computer run systems, you know, both computers, but also, you know, droids, which are ubiquitous in Star Wars. Um, And we see kind of different personalities and stuff. What do you think constitutes uh, sentience and self-awareness? Yeah, so this is like a topic that I guess, you know, my education and stuff, we didn't necessarily think about this too much because machine learning right now, at least, is just like so far away from that. You know, this is like more of a philosophical question or something, Um, but really interesting to think about for sure. And yeah, definitely like the droids in Star Wars you see so many like personality traits in them. And like, that's why we care about, you know, R2D2 and and BB-8, because even though they're not like speaking a language that we understand, 
you know, they have loyalty to different characters and they are able to come in and like make choices that save the day, you know, in these different scenarios. And yeah, it just feels like we are really, really far away from that. But it is really exciting, I guess, to think about. Hopefully, as we're like building AI and potentially getting to a future where there is like sentience or self-awareness within these AI (laughs) powered machines, it's just really important to think about like, how are we building them? What are the like ethics that we're using to build these things? Because we want to hopefully have cute R2-D2s and not scary you know, oh, right. machines that are like doing the opposite of what we wanted them to do. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking, you know, the way that we've heard of like Star Trek showing technology has influenced people making the technology, you know, like tricorders and flip phones and those sorts of things. I'm wondering now if we're not actually there in terms of droids, if in whatever, 100 years or something like, like that, when they are, do you think that like people will be using Star Wars? Like, oh, we need to make it sassy or, you know, because R2-D2 is <laughs> sassy. Like, you know, like will people specifically try to make a BB-8 that purrs, you know, or something like that and <laughs> and, and stuff because of Star Wars? I'm, I'm curious about that now. Or or someone's going to want a nervous translator droid because C-3PO right. is so iconic. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm sure that that will be the case. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'd never really thought about that before. So that's that's kind of fun. <laughs> well, the, the scary thing is, is, what if the droid or the computer decides for itself, you know what, I don't want to be a, a nervous protocol droid. I want to be, you know, confident and capable. And yeah. we'd be like, you've exceeded what we programmed you to be. <laughs> yeah. Luckily, though, I do think we are like generations away from that uh that's somebody else's so. problem. So. <laughs> well, in, in the philosophical discussion about it, um, or in the Star Wars context, you know, what are some of the ethics behind, yeah, reprogramming droids, you know, a, a memory wipe to switch them from either good, you know, imperial or re- rebellion droids, or even just for getting a new owner, right? Like R2-D2 and C-3PO uh, have their memories wiped after the prequels, uh, you know? Like- well, no, R2 doesn't. Oh, R2 doesn't? Really? Yeah, they say, yeah, wipe the mind of the protocol droid. And then R2 is like, ha ha. And R2 doesn't just like fill C-3PO back in of like Anakin Skywalker built nope. you and I belong to <laughs> Luke's mother and just nobody nope. understands him. Wow. Okay. I, I'm pretty I sure if he, if, if he did that, 3PO and him would get their minds wiped. So just R2 just keeps his mouth shut. Wow, I totally missed that detail somehow. Anyway, though, the the, the <laughs> basic philosophical question there still stands because it happens to K2SO to, when he gets captured by the rebellion and stuff like that. So, you know, is that something that's ethical to do if these droids are forming personalities? Another great question. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I was thinking about this um, as I was like catching up on the recent season of The Mandalorian and they do like refer to the droids as like humans almost you know like someone at one point is like yeah i used to work with that that guy or they refer to the droid as like an old coworker essentially um and so i think once something does have like personality and even like now with like siri and alexa i feel like they don't have personalities but like we do treat them with more like humanity almost or like uh than we would just like our like our toast something yeah, you just, yeah, or like Roombas even, they're kind of little, you know, they, they're like, we're designing things to make them more like people, I guess. <laughs> and that's like right. how things are already trending. So yeah, if you just gave yeah. Siri or, or Alexa some like eye spots or whatever, you know, yeah. then it would really change things, I feel like, and people would be even nicer to them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah it now is. I'm thinking about you just put some googly eyes on a Roomba. <laughs> If you, if you could give it a voice so it would be voice activated, yeah, people might think of it very differently than, you know, something that doesn't have a face or a voice. That's Yeah, well, yeah, and thinking about the different droids, too, you know, some of them do speak English, you know, like B2 in Andor. And it's not just a voice. It's kind of like a sad little stuttery voice. So it's yeah. just like immediate sort of connection, like, oh, honey, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, versus the droids that just sort of beep away you know so that's i'm always curious behind the scenes how they make that choice you know like b2 needs to speak english and and also the genders you know like those droids are sort of undeniably gendered uh which is very confusing really when you think about it especially for the ones that don't have a human voice that that is very interesting yeah when they don't even have a voice how do we how is that implied 
Right, um, exactly. Yeah. How do you gender different beeps and stuff like that? But we manage it. Mm. Now, that just makes me think that, we you know, we kind of have the, these levels of intelligence in our own minds and with organic things of like, you know, humans are up here and then the animals that we think of as intelligent, like, you know, dogs and dolphins and then other things that are kind of like other smart pet type things and then things that are lower down. And so it's like, if you think of, you know, C-3PO as intelligent because it can speak with us and then like R2 and BB-8 with their beeps, they're kind of like the pet that, and they've kind of been described as... You know, it's like R two D two is the dog, Chopper is the cat type <laughs> things that we can we can understand them. We have empathy for them, but you know they don't necessarily speak our language. But they understand us. We understand them. Yeah. Occasionally, Chopper tries to kill people. Yeah. Are any of those sort of factors, you know, sounds of voices, gender, you know, assigning sort of personalities, is that sort of in the discussion for artificial intelligence? You know, maybe in places where they are working on more like robotics focused work, that could be a discussion. Like I'm thinking with um, if you've seen any of the robots that like run, they're teaching them to run uh, parkour courses. Oh, really? (laughs) Um, There could (laughs) be like, I would believe that there would be maybe discussion about like, you know, the physical features of the robot. Is it like maybe, I I don't know. I hope it's, I don't know. I don't know if I hope that they're thinking about that or not with like really regards to gender, but um Right. Or like with a lot of tech, like, you know, there tend to be a lot of men in the room who are designing these things. So it might just be that these things happen where it kind of has the features similar to the people who are like building the mm-hmm. machines. But but yeah, as far as I know, I haven't been in any of those uh, conversations. Yeah. That is a serious issue about you know people in the room and what when machines are learning, what are they learning? And, you know, sometimes it sounds like you read articles every now and then of they, they let a machine go on the internet. And after a while, they're like, no, this is bad. It became racist because it came across a lot of racist content. You know, what can we do about that? Or, or how do we program around that or, or recognize the biases that the, the designers might have? Yeah, yeah, that is a huge topic of discussion um, in the AI world. Uh, And even in cases where they didn't just let the algorithm loose on the internet, there are like algorithms that uh, were built to like recognize faces and, you know, not enough people of color were included in the data set that was used to train that algorithm. And so then it, it performs way worse on the faces of people of color versus the faces of white people. Um, So there's like a ton of really negative examples like that across the field of AI um, and how we, you know, improve upon those mistakes and not let them happen again is we just have to be a lot more mindful about the data that we're showing to these algorithms to train them because they easily could have shown the algorithm, you know, the same percentage of faces from of all different colors and could have really improved, you know, the performance of the, this algorithm <laughs> just by right. diversifying their data set. And so I think because these conversations are happening more, hopefully that those examples come up less often, but there's yeah, a lot of factors to think about and be really like proactive about as we're training these models. Well, yeah. And when we were talking about those programs sort of looking like the people in the room, it made me remember that one of the artists that we've spoken to before who works on Star Wars, Jake Lent Davis, has drawn protocol droids for other civilizations, right? It's like, uh, you know, humans have protocol droids like C-3PO, but wouldn't the uh, Mon Calamari have a protocol droid, you know, more with their features and colorations and stuff like that? Um, and so they haven't made it into canon as far as I know yet, but I'm waiting for the day because I think that's such an interesting idea. If we had three eyes, the robots would have three eyes, you know, those sorts of things. Yeah. And another great way to like make these things happen is, of course, to have just more people in the room who represent all different types of backgrounds and races and ability levels. And yeah, just diversity just improves everything. Um, pretty right. much. So Definitely. Well, we talked a lot about robotic AI, and I guess that's probably just because we, you know, talking about droids and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, there's lots of non-robotic AI. I was at the dentist recently, and they, like, took my x-rays of my teeth and clicked a button that said AI, and it, like, circled all the, like, these might be cavities, and then the doctor, you know, checked it over or whatever. And I was like, I haven't seen that before, but maybe that's been used for years, and I just never saw the check button. Um, But, like, there is AI. It's become a big thing now with art and, you know, the writer's strike and all that kind of stuff, but it's kind of everywhere. And the machine learning thing has been around for a long time. 
Yeah. And I definitely in my like career have worked more on, on the side of AI that's not, you know, associated with robots. Um, so it is more just like software. It is really all over the place. Like we, you know, we all interact with ads all the time. And those are like, you know, there's a lot of AI behind the scenes, figuring out what you search online and trying to predict what you might want to look at next. My career has been focused a lot on building AI to support environmental research and decision making. So similar to like your dentist example, where the AI sort of suggested what the doctor should maybe take a closer look at. Um, a lot of the AI I've built has been sort of more on that in that assistive category where we are helping scientists be able to more quickly get through these large mountains of data that they've collected about the animals that they're researching to be able to like suggest, okay, here's, you know, of these 100,000 pictures that you took, like, here's the few that seem the most important um, to take a closer look at. Or like right now, I work at a company and we build um, global maps. So we take satellite images and then use AI to automatically generate these maps of what's actually on the ground in the images. Yeah, there's a lot of AI kind of all around us. How is AI in these cases different than just simply having an algorithm, just a program that can stay stitched together all these images? What makes it AI versus something else? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So like a traditional computer program has, you know, exactly every case that can come up, like what should the computer do? So it's like a very sort of strict recipe that the computer should follow. But then AI or machine learning, it's more trying to teach the computer what it should do in cases maybe that it's never seen before. So how can we sort of set it up so we don't have to explicitly program every single case that might come up and what it should do? So that's where sort of that pattern recognition um, idea comes in and giving it enough good training data to be able to generalize to cases that it's never seen before. Yeah. And then eventually it starts training itself. Honestly, that part is really hard as well. Um, that part, I would say, is not as common um, at this point, for sure. Like with the the AI that was let loose on the internet, like it goes out and starts consuming all of these, even if it's just tweets or something that it's consuming, like that's going to send it in a whole maybe new direction from what it was like originally, you know, the scope of what it was originally trained with. So right now, I think it's it's safer when there is more human oversight over what you're actually releasing into the world. <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, 3PO says it in Attack of the Clones, machines making machines, how perverse. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the sense that there should be some oversight. And definitely the Trade Federation was big on that by having a master control switch over their battle droids. Mm, um, yeah. What do you think is the role of human oversight in the types of machine learning that we have now? You know, obviously we're here to guide them and, and with the, the applications that you've been developing, it, it sounds like, you know, they're very assistive that they identify patterns in the data that then somebody should look at and investigate further. Well, I, I'm certainly curious in Star Wars, there's an odd or no correlation between the tasks that droids are assigned to, right? Like if you're going to call them like, quote unquote, mindless or whatever, you know, in terms of R2-D2 serving drinks, or I feel like the droid factory, the battle droid factory has, yeah, droids from Attack of the Clones that James was just mentioning, you know, but then there are droids that are in the army, you know, the, our whole army is made of, of the battle droids and, and stuff like that versus... In Andor, I mean, I understand that we needed those three episodes, but like, is it realistic that the Empire would have humans building components, repetitive, you know, components like that? Wouldn't that just, you know, we have uh, robots in 2023 that could do, you know, make that exact thing, I feel like. So, you know, what do you see in Star Wars that sort of parallels or is very different from what we have here? So one thing I was thinking about along those lines was I can't, and maybe you you can think of an example, but I couldn't think of an example of a droid doing like a more creative mm -hmm. task, like playing music or like making art. But we do have people developing AI right now to do those things. And that to me is just like so backwards. <laughs> like why I, I really think the Star Wars world has done a good job of having droids, you know, do these sort of like tedious tasks that people don't want to do. And to me, that feels like that's the real strength of AI is to do pretty repetitive tasks really fast and a lot faster sometimes than people can do them. 
Um, and then people don't have to spend, you know, hours doing these sort of mindless things. And then we have more time to create art and to, you know, write things and play music. Um, and that's what they so. said when they invented washing machines. It would free up time. <laughs> yeah. So we could be yeah. more creative. Right. You know, it's a yeah, good question, still. though. James, as our sort of resident, remembers every single scene. Uh, <laughs> can you think of a time that a droid is being creative? Being creative. Because um, honestly, I can't either. You know, does Chopper ever help with the murals or? Um, know? certainly with the, the creativity aspect, I I'm not sure. I can I can think of one off the top of my head. I remember in the book Last Call, there's a kind of weird droid cult that like the Brotherhood of Oh no, I can't remember. It, it's it, they they kind of want to take organics and kind of borgify them they're they're kind of like making cyborg zombies because they're and, and it's a very bizarre cult but it's obviously something they weren't necessarily programmed to do it's just something that eventually they evolved and you know created their own belief system of who they are and what they think perfection is and so that is kind of a part of creativity is having sort of this philosophy and coming up with a, a spiritual component which you know we would automatically assume that you know, machines wouldn't get, like they wouldn't even fathom these ideas of what is life, what is beyond life, uh, you know, what is the goal? Yeah. And certainly with what where AI is right now, like I don't think it even, I mean, it definitely is not even capable of being creative. Everything that is, you know, output by AI has human inputs. <laughs> so it's like anything, music that it creates, like none of that is going to be completely original or that's like the beauty of humanity. Like I, we don't want AI to try to replicate that. Why, why would we need it to do that? We, we have humans who can create beautiful things already. Yeah. I, I don't know. There's a lot of people who think that, you know, certainly is like, oh, I can have the chat GBT write things for me. That way I don't have to pay a human to do. Um, case in point, like the, with the writers uh, and the writer's strike or with artists, you know, it's like I can basically get the labor without having to pay for it. And it's okay if it is taking bits and pieces of lots of other earlier things that it's been input that, you know, it's basically liberally cribbing from other people's art or other people's writing um, or the, the bulk of human literature. At, at what point is, you know, that creativity of just coming up with things, even if it is derived from other stuff, but, you know, putting it together in a new way, that's still in some sense kind of creative. I guess, yeah, depends on your <laughs> definition. Yeah. Yeah. To me, that just seems like more, again, the human is the creative one because they're the one putting in the yeah. prompt, right? Like instead of just saying, you know, I want to look at a Vincent Van Gogh painting, you're saying, I want to look at a picture of my favorite coffee mug in the style of a Van Gogh painting, right? The creativity is still on your side, uh, the, you know, the human side of that interaction, I feel like. I was yeah. thinking the only, and we don't actually see it, but the creativity I would love to see is... Was it in Book of Boba Fett or The Mandalorian where they go back to the Moss Eisley Cantina and it's like run by droids now? I, I like thinking of that like droid bartender, maybe like, you know, it's probably just pour a beer, pour a spotchka, you know, whatever, whatever. But like maybe he's like a mixologist, you know, and he like comes up with his own cocktails. So that, you know, they could, again, analyze like what are all these traits of drinks that a particular species likes? analyze that down distill it if you will um, <laughs> and and come up with new drink ideas that would be like oh yeah that, that if we mix these things together you know it might work and um you know the same way that bartenders try and make new things uh here on earth that you could do it you know certainly with a, a bartender droid or a medical droid you can have that in giant encyclopedia of knowledge to make sure that you're not mixing bad things together that will have a bad interaction um, maybe it would work fine on an Ewok, but if you give the same drink to a Trandoshan, it would burn their tongue. Um, right. And you don't want to do that because the Trandoshan will rip your arms off. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's all that extra knowledge that can be stored that, you know, most bartenders know, yeah, like don't mix these two things together. It tastes bad. But when you're dealing with, you know, thousands of alien physiologies, you might not remember, oh, yeah, don't give the methane breathers this. Yeah. Yeah, in which case it's better to have a droid bartender, you know, and there are skilled droids. Like, I don't know that we see a lot of medical care given by anything but a droid, you know, and that to me says something. It's not just these, you know, tedious tasks. It's also ones that are maybe too important to trust to a, a emotional human or whatever. 
which then makes you wonder is like, there's a lot of other tasks that they trust to emotional humans. Like, <laughs> hey, we have the ability to target the thermal exhaust port. We're going to let a human decide and let their timing, you know, of their reflexes decide as opposed to just like computer controlled, controlled weaponry, which, right. you know, doesn't really speak to the heart of Star Wars and, and the individual <laughs> against the giant faceless machine. But no, yeah. but we have that, you yeah. know, in in our world too about you know people would still rather drive cars than let ai drive cars and like i'm pretty sure the math is in the favor yeah. of the ai in this case but maybe i mean you certainly know more about that uh gracie you know and so what do you see that sort of nonsensical in that sort of trust in ai you know realm from the public yeah, yeah, you're so right with the self-driving cars. I totally, yeah, have seen those numbers too, where I'm pretty sure they would get in less accidents than people. But um, just one one accident from a self-driving car, even the few that are on the roads now, like I feel like makes headlines. So yeah, it's just, you know, the aspect of like change and sort of the sociological, you know, factor uh, plays into that as well. And I think with a lot of AI, you know, like, um, trust is definitely a big thing with AI that we have now. Uh, so for example, like, whether you're an Alexa person, or like a Siri person, um, maybe, you know, I, I often am like yelling at my maps app, you know, like you, <laughs> you know, you, you're changing the rerouting in the middle of the, the drive and just like one, a few experiences like that can tarnish your trust in like a piece of technology. So and then the whole like process of like evaluating AI that's going to go out into the world is basically the developers figuring out how much do we trust this algorithm and the outputs that it's giving to, you know, and we're evaluating it like numerically and quantitatively, but essentially like putting a number to how much we trust it before we're like, okay, it's ready for prime time. <laughs> like we will let people have at it and because people then put in things that you never expected anyone to, you know, to do with your technology. So we talked a little bit about how we're not at all close to like the droid level of self-awareness and their ability to, to learn that we've seen Star Wars. But do you see where we are as close to any other uh, science fiction type things in terms of machine learning, whether it's like Skynet from Terminator or something from Star Trek? What future are we hitting uh, up against first? Yeah, yeah. Oh gosh. I mean, I think like the self-driving cars, I'm sure will be here. Probably that's like a sort of parallel that I could see coming sooner rather than later. I could definitely see like there's a lot of sort of assistive robotic technology that's being developed. So maybe it won't be a full on droid who's like, you know, conversing with you and like anticipating your needs or anything. But like maybe they're helping with a lot more like straightforward, basic tasks that can be more controlled by, you know, whoever created that technology. Hopefully no, you know, evil robots taking over. I don't see that happening anytime soon. But that's good. Yeah, I think there are definitely like baby <laughs> steps that are happening towards like hopefully the helpful technology that we see in various sci-fi universes. Yeah, I'm curious if you know anybody or or have talked with anybody who's sort of in the artificial intelligence field that is sort of taking over the creative pursuits, you know, the chat GBT, the art, the writing, you know, that's a big part of the writer strike is, you know, wanting that sort of stuff in their contracts um, that they can't be replaced especially because these things are trained on their own work. If you know from the developer standpoint, if they like recognize those risks, you know, and we're like, well, someone's going to do it. It might as well be us. Or if, I don't know, are they the em evil empire, you know, on this just being like, who cares, you know, uh, progress forward. Yeah. So definitely I know people who are working in like the sort of natural language processing chat GPT realm. I don't think I know anyone who worked directly on chat GPT, but I think all my friends who work in AI are like very thoughtful people who are, you know, hopefully going to be the voice in the room if things are being proposed that like, okay, we're going to sell our technology to, you know, uh, NBC so that it can write all of our, sh all of their shows for them. I think it is kind of up to developers, even if we're just, you know, one person on one team within like this giant company, like, I think hopefully schools are doing a good job of educating people who are going into these fields that like your voice does matter and you and you have like a responsibility to say something about how the technology that you build is being used and to, you know, help foresee the uses of the use cases of it and like 
even if it's something we didn't intend for it to be used for, like, what can we do to put guardrails in place so that maybe it's not as easy for the bad guys to, to use it yeah. for whatever use case? Certainly, there's there's a lot of things that it would be nice to either make sure that there's the guardrails on or, you know, it's like when we develop facial recognition, that's good if it's being used by the right people, but really scary when the wrong people have recognition and they can you know surveil you across the planet, like, you know, numerous TV shows and, and movies and stuff. Well, they're um, just trying to keep order. I mean, you know, didn't you watch Andor? They had those, you know, <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, and like, we, we also saw they, that in Fast and Furious with the God's Eye. Right. They have a reason, you know, they have. The, and that's the thing is like, I mean, maybe the Empire in this case, because it's so far is like, maybe they know they're evil. But I don't know, you know, Andor really showing the sort of like, there are these discussions and they're like, well, yeah, but this is, of course, this is what we would do. Uh, you know, I don't trust humans any more than I trust, you know, the Empire characters in Star Wars, personally. Yeah, it, it shouldn't have to be up to, the, you know, the individual developers on these teams. Like, there should definitely oh. be more oversight and forethought from, you know, the powers that be the larger, more powerful, yeah. upper I, I think people. that the, <laughs> the issue with that is that, you know, if you make it for sale, you're relinquishing all that thought to whatever the customer, their, their motive is. And, and so that that's always, you know, problematic if you're selling it to people whose whose values don't align to we want this to be used for good, but right. you know, right. there's other people who want to use it for control. It's a big topic of discussion and an important discussion. Do you foresee that there will be laws or oversight committees or things like that, you know, coming up relatively soon? Yeah, I know that there is a lot of that sort of happening already. It's probably, you know, behind where it should be at this point, but uh, it is definitely in the works. And I know like, you know, on like a federal level, they're working on that kind of stuff. And I'm hoping that, you know, we'll start to see like the effects of that soon. Well, can you tell us a little bit more? I'm curious, just from a wildlife lover's perspective myself, like what, you know, your sort of go-to anecdote for, you know, what you've been working on, how it has helped, you know, in like a specific case for for a certain species or a ecosystem. Do you work in just one part of the world or or is it pretty uh, widespread? Yeah, um, the projects I've worked on have been kind of widespread. And with the stuff I'm working on now, we're creating global maps. So I could be, you know, looking at one part of the world one day and then a different part of the world the next day. And yeah, as far as projects go, like I've worked on really cool teams that are trying to um, support like killer whale conservation. That was a really, really fun one um, and really like special I worked on one with dolphin whistles. We were trying to build AI that would recognize the difference between individual dolphin whistles um, and recognize the individuals themselves by their whistle. That was really fun. And the stuff I'm doing right now is more sort of on a ecosystem level, not looking at one specific species, but um, building these maps so that we can start to see the change year over year in much larger areas across the globe. And uh just allow decision makers to have these large sets of data and um, more more and more frequently updated sets of data as well so that they can see that change happening in terms of like, um, what's the effect of like a forest fire or a flood or, you know, human expansion, like how are things changing over time and hopefully help inform what should be done going forward. Well, that definitely sounds like a uh, program for good that uh, all, all of these things to help give us the, the tools we need to, to help better make smart decisions about our Earth. Did the dolphin program succeed in identifying individual dolphins? Yeah, so it was based on the, the work of a few different scientists, but the one we were working with, uh, Dr. Layla Sai, she is amazing. She had been working on this for, I think, like 35 years, recording all these whistles. And um, she and her colleagues had figured out that each dolphin does indeed make a unique whistle. So that was like, I mean, all, all her. And then we kind of came in and like, she had all these many, many years of dolphin whistles. So we had this huge set of data that we could use to train an AI algorithm to tell the difference between them. And uh, it was in the end, like pretty successful. So <laughs> it was pretty good at telling the difference. Well, uh, if somebody was interested in going into machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, how would they go about that? Yeah, there are so many resources, like there's the traditional, traditional sort of route I put in quotations where, uh, you know, you can 
get a four year degree or, you know, as much schooling as you want, essentially, and go about it that way. Um, but there are also so many online resources. A lot of them are free where you can just kind of learn about how does machine learning work? How could I apply it to a problem that I already care about? And you can kind of build up your skill set that way as well. So I think there's a lot of different entry points um, depending on whether like what you want to do with it. It's an exciting field to be in and we need a lot of thoughtful people in it so that we you know, can make AI that's going to go out and hopefully help people live their lives rather than the opposite. (laughs) Well, tell us about your favorite Star Wars character. I'm curious to know now if it's a droid or not. (laughs) Yeah, so it's hard to pick just one, but I think I would go with BB-8. And that's probably like the most basic answer, but just how can you, so cute, you know. (laughs) and just saves the day so i i love bb8 <laughs> that's a yeah, very BB-8 good bb8 is definitely more huggable than like that blue and white droid it's true. <laughs> it's true well and also just that's the real pet sort of relationship right like yeah <laughs> bb8 is just like a sweet puppy and like <laughs> runs up to poe you know when he finds him gets tummy scritches like yeah I just love it. it's it, yeah bb8 is, is that's the droid I would want, at least, you know, I don't need right. a droid to translate for me or farm for me or do my chores. Like, no, I would want uh, a BB-8 for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Good choice. Uh, that that kind of brings up the ethics of, you know, if we have a bunch of droids that, you know, are programmed to do what we would consider the, the menial repetitive tasks, it's like we're basically making a whole group of an, an underclass that has to do servile work. and you know, humanity hasn't had a good track record with that in the past. Right. That's true. Droid rights. We didn't even get into that, you know, L3 is a droid rights campaign. So. Yeah. So many, you know, important topics that we need to consider as we go forward. Yeah. Do you think in Star Wars, like if you were to watch it again, do you think these topics were debated, you know, in the various Senate chambers, you know, or are are there rules or is it just sort of like a hodgepodge of, you know, people do what they want with with the programming? I mean, that's a great question. I mean, it feels like there must be some sort of oversight or like sort of overarching rules about droids, um, especially because they... They aren't that different from each other from like world to world or like planet to planet, you know, and they seem to be kind of treated similarly across the board. But uh, yeah, Yeah. I I would believe that there were Senate discussions about this. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Then we get to the Ewoks who uh, worship the first droid that they come across as a golden god. And and the Senate was like, oh, we missed. No, no, actually, they solved that because they had programmed three people not to impersonate a deity. They have that covered. (laughs) <laughs> exactly exactly at least one person thought of that or or there was a, i think we talked about this with our um indigenous rights expert too where it was like not necessarily someone thought about it in advance but like mm, someone got into trouble and that's why there's a rule on the books so yeah that seems likely <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, is there information we can find, you know, if our listeners want to follow you on social media or check out your publications or your work anywhere? Yeah, um, I'm just at Gracie Ermy on Instagram and Twitter. There should be some exciting like updates and things from uh, my team and my the company that I work at um, soon. So those will be like on on Twitter and stuff. You can find out what we're working on and look at our maps. They're pretty cool maps to look at and just uh, see what's happening in your area, what's changing over time. So and the right. company Impact Observatory, in case you. <laughs> And you're going to be on a Comic-Con panel coming up soon for those people in San Diego Comic-Con 2023. Yes. Yeah. I'll be on a panel um, called Dr. Evil Scientists as Supervillains. So we'll be talking about all the supervillains who are scientists. (laughs) So it is a trend for sure. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So I'll also be at the the If Men Steam Fair, which is happening at the Comic-Con Museum in Balboa Park. So you don't need a Comic-Con ticket to get in, just have to buy a ticket to the museum. And it's from 1030 to 130, Friday through Sunday of Comic-Con. So it'll be really fun. There'll be a lot of scientists from all different fields who are going to be having little fun activities um, for kids to do to learn about their field of science. So definitely check it out if you're around. 
Awesome. Cool. Always good to have Comic-Con alternatives for, for people. So great. I really appreciate you coming and chatting artificial intelligence, machine learning, clearing all of that kind of up and, and taking all of our wandering philosophical questions here. <laughs> thanks for being here. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Gracie. That wraps up this episode of Star Wars Ologies. We want to thank our guest, Gracie Ermey, and we want to thank all of you for listening, especially Jennifer, who writes in saying that she enjoyed listening to our linguistics episode so much she missed her turn. If you're going to be in San Diego for San Diego Comic-Con, we have several panels that you can come see us at and enjoy. The first one is on Thursday, July 20th from 12 to 1. It is Indiana Jones and the Nexus of Archaeology, History, and Punching Fascists. It's going to be in room Grand 10 at the Marriott Marquis San Diego Marina in the, the, the hotel that's adjacent to the convention center. Uh, Indiana Jones is back for more fortune and glory, and the indie films have shaped the public's view of the world of archaeology and artifacts for more than 40 years. Now with the release of Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, let's examine the legacy of the man with the whip and the hat. What do the Indiana Jones films get right and wrong about real-world archaeological adventures? Do the antiquities collected by Dr. Jones really belong in a museum? Or does he? How do historical artifacts connect to modern politics? How has Indiana Jones impacted the archaeological field? We're going to talk about all these things uh, on our panel of globe-trotting archaeologists and cultural resource experts uh, as we talk science and ethics of Indiana Jones around the 20th century world. Awesome. And I'm moderating a panel called The Science of Superpowers. We're going to have a great group of female scientists to go through what makes a superhero and a supervillain. Humans have been fascinated with the potential to gain superpowers for generations. Join a panel of scientific experts for a Q&A about the real-life science behind superhuman abilities. Would a lab accident really transform your DNA? Is it possible to harness regenerative powers from the animal kingdom? Can a mutation make you telekinetic? Hear about the up-to-date science and technology of bringing humanity closer to becoming superheroes and potentially supervillains. That takes place Sunday, July 23rd from 2 to 3 p.m. in the Marriott Marquis uh, Room Grand 10. Uh, my other panel is back on Friday uh, from 7 to 8 p.m. in Room 7AB. It is Star Wars Andor, Making a Rebel, Making a Rebellion. Uh, we'll be talking about the Andor series, uh, how, how it speaks today to an audience, all about fighting oppression. Um, we look at the first season of the Disney Plus series and examine what type of people are drawn to stand up to tyranny. How do individual dissenters start forming movements? Why does this show resonate so well? Uh, we'll have a variety of panelists join us as we tackle the fight of, to restore freedom to the galaxy. Again, that's Room 7AB on Friday, July 21st, 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Awesome. And we will have recordings of those up for you within the few weeks after Comic-Con as well. So if you can't make it to San Diego this year, we're looking out for you. If you're looking for the links we might have talked about during this episode, you can check out our show notes page. It's available at skywalkingthroughneverland.com slash star dash Warsologies. And also check out the Star Warsologies YouTube channel where we post the episodes with related visuals from Star Wars. If you have an idea for a topic for Star Wars Ologies or know an expert we should interview, let us know at Star Wars Ologies on Twitter and Instagram or at Star Wars Ologies at gmail.com. That's S T A R W A R S O L O G I E S. We also have our fan group on Facebook. It is the Star Wars Ologies podcast fan group. So uh, you can find it really easily. Join today and chat with us and your fellow listeners. Please also rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on your favorite service and share it with your friends. No topic is off limits. Even if you're wondering whether the First Order had a medieval festival, would it be called a Kylo Ren fair? <laughs> That's a new one. I like it, James. <laughs> uh, we are part of the Skywalking Network, where you can also find a variety of other great shows about Star Wars, Disney, and Marvel, including Talking Apes, the Neverland Clubhouse, and the flagship show Skywalking Through Neverland. And there's also a YouTube show called Today in Star Wars History. You can find all of that at skywalkingnetwork.com. See you next time on Star Wars Ologies when we'll be sharing the recordings of our panels from Comic-Con. Comic-Con! Comic-Con! Woo!